it's humbling to, to uh, follow Dr. Bullard in so many different ways. Um, as, uh, as all of you know, he is known as the father of the environmental justice movement. Um, I just want to thank you all as a starting point for the opportunity to be here today. Um, my own background as a civil rights lawyer for the last two decades plus started working at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund and I was working among other things on access to health care and disparities in access to health care and over time really appreciated the deep work of the Institute of Medicine um, and welcomed the 2002 volume Unequal Treatment um, among other things. So uh, that was groundbreaking. I am sure that the work you're doing now will have a similar kind of out, uh, uh, groundbreaking um, impact. Um, so while I was at the Legal Defense Fund, we were focused on the range of issues, the range of disparities that affected uh, disparities in health status, the kinds of things that were discussed in unequal, um, unequal treatment. And over time, came to realize, uh, largely through the work of Dr. Bullard, how important the inputs were, how important on the front end these disparities and exposures were that then led to the need for the treatment that we were discussing in unequal treatment. And so my own career uh, somewhat followed that path. I went from working on this range of inequalities in uh, health status and the many reasons that there were inequalities and the, um, the problems of unequal access to health care to really focusing more and more on those inputs and wound up about six years ago at Earth Justice, um, which is a, what did you call them? PW, whatever, a predominantly white institution, a PWI, um, in this case in the advocacy community. Um, Earth Justice works on a number of issues affecting all of us, the climate, energy, um, wild places, those wonderful places that we do get to hike and use our brains. Um, but my focus has been on um, the part of our mission that is guaranteeing the right of all people to a healthy environment and particularly focus on vulnerable populations. And the focus today is on the critical role that civil rights plays in community-based strategies for addressing health disparities. So um, to get to the, the point of what I want to say is that legal strategies are critical to any movement forward, that legal strategies go hand in hand to community with community-based participatory research. They go hand in hand with efforts to lift up and engage communities who are affected, that um, just as we can't ignore the role that race plays in coming up with solutions, we can't af uh, afford to ignore the advocacy strategies and the, the means, the levers for change. So what I want to do today is talk a little bit about one situation where we're using civil rights strategies and why, talk a little bit about what those civil rights strategies are about and some of the foundational principles in those civil rights strategies and then bring it all back together to, uh, <clears throat> to talk about the role of civil rights and environmental law as critical levers for change. This is the same slide, uh, strangely enough, that Dr. Bullard had. Um, <laughs> we think alike here. Um, <clears throat> the root causes of disparities in health status include the disproportionate exposure to various pollutants, as Dr. Bullard so passionately described. Um, this includes the disproportionate siting of health hazards, waste sites, industrial sites. It includes worker exposures. Um, both in the industrial context and in the agricultural context, so critical, particularly in the South, and in the farm worker context. We do a lot of work on pesticide exposure. It includes exposure to toxic, toxic chemicals in our homes, in our furniture, in our toys, in, um, in you know, the, the uh, baby bottles we've read about. And it's particularly a problem in low-income communities where choice, toys may be cheaper. They may include uh, products that aren't well tested, may include lead, may include cadmium. Um, in the cheaper construction of buildings, we all read about the formaldehyde in trailers, for example, and lack of access to open parks and, and, and open spaces. 
This di uh, disproportionate exposure is a determinant of disparities in health. And race has salience, as we just heard, as a factor in the risks of exposure. Now, some of you might have read about the long uh, history of debate around which came first. Was it um, these exposures? And because um, land is cheap, low-income communities of color somehow moved to the problem, or uh, did the problem move to them? And there's a great article by Paul Mohai and Robin Saha, which came first, people or pollution, which again reinforces the same finding over and over, that there's strong evidence that disparate siting for facilities is on the basis of race and ethnicity. The context, and I'm going to quote Dr. Bullard here, communities are not all created equal. As we see in Flint, as we see all across the country, there are two pieces to this. One is substantive, that is the disproportionate exposure and health risks uh, that are contributors to disparities in health status, and one is procedural, uh, the lack of democratic accountability. We see it at play in Flint, and we see it all across the country. That Communities cry out, they speak out, they talk about their experience, they hold the dirty water up to elected officials, they hold the dirty water up in hearings, and yet they are discounted, they are ignored, their cries are rendered invisible. Relevant to my argument that civil rights is a critical lever in this effort is this procedural problem. We all know that mental health issues result from lack of information, from frustration, and that people get so disillusioned that nobody is listening to them that they wind up not being able to engage. Civil rights is a mechanism for bringing these issues back out into the open, for stating, for giving voice to the problems, and for doing it in a way that is race conscious where people say, yes, that's what's happening to me. It is one strategy among many, but it is an important strategy for that reason. Well, I want to outline but one example of a community that is currently employing this strategy um, based in civil rights law to address disparities in environmental exposures. Um, this is a picture, the, the house is in Kingston, Tennessee. Some of you may remember in, in the late 2000s um, that the largest coal ash disaster in the country's history occurred when coal ash breached its lagoon and flooded a number of homes um, in Kingston, Tennessee, which is a, another PWI, a, a predominantly white uh, community, actually, which was largely middle class. And it was a disaster and, um, and declared a Superfund site. And there was a lot of pressure on the Tennessee Valley Authority and EPA to clean up that site. What did they do? It took them a little while, but they decided to bore, put the coal ash on uh, on um, trains and move it. In fact, they had to build a railroad spur, which you'll see in a second. Move it to this town, Uniontown, Alabama. Four million tons of coal ash moved to this town. I don't know if you can see in this uh, slide, the town is all boarded up. There's no movie theater. Movie theater was closed after desegregation. There's no swimming pool. Swimming pool was closed after desegregation. You cannot get a place, uh, anything to eat after about 4 o'clock. There's one restaurant in town, a country kitchen, which closes. You can go to the gas station and get something to eat. Very few businesses. I asked one of my, um, my clients and, and, and friends, when did this town get so poor? You know, what happened here? She said, well, it was when the feds came in and closed down the drug trade. Okay? Just let that sink in, that the concept of wealth in the community was when there was a drug trade. This is a very, very poor community. The per capita income is between eight and nine thousand dollars. It's 87 percent African-American and this is where the TVA in its wisdom decided to send the coal ash. They built this railroad spur um, and uh, this is a picture of the mountain of coal ash. Now you see that's County Road 1. Across from County Road 1 is where people live. Um, I'll show you a couple quick slides. That's the mountain of coal ash. Uh, this is what it looked like around Arrowhead Landfill in Uniontown. And you can see County Road 1, and all along there is where people live. There are homes. This is a historic African-American area. It was a plantation area of slavery. In fact, um, some of the uh, handful of uh, folks in the white community still live in the old plantation houses. And uh, people live on land that their 
uh, great grandparents uh, were enslaved on. This is uh, uh, three of the children in the area who are standing on the front porch of the home, and you can see in the background the landfill. Um, Arrowhead takes not only coal ash, not only that four million tons of coal ash, but it takes garbage from 33 states across the country. This is where we're sending our garbage. Uh, people are, in fact, um, very motivated to make change. And um, they formed Black Belt Citizens Fighting for Health and Justice. They went to listening sessions. They went to hearings. Uh, they, this is a story you'll see over and over. The closer you dig in to, and work with communities, the more you see they really have organized for change. And they did all the things that they could do. I will tell you that I went to the first press conference that was ever held by activists in Uniontown, Alabama. I was told by some folks in Uniontown, oh, we never had those troubles that they had there in Selma. And uh, the first press conference at the town hall was held just last year. It was, it was pretty amazing. Um, government has not come in and done testing. There has been no water testing that is official, despite the fact that folks went to the Alabama Department of Environmental Management, went to EPA Region 4, said you got to do something, said we're being poisoned. The water keepers took pictures of the coal ash blowing through the streets. They did absolutely nothing to protect people. And um, a, a lovely uh, toxicologist from, from uh, Birmingham, from um, Samford uh, College, came down and on her own uh, will and off her own dime, she worked with some students to um, do a little bit of water sampling on a ditch right in front of the um, right in front of the mountain of coal ash, and she found, indeed, high levels of conductivity and other, um, other evidence that related uh, water in the ditch to the coal ash. I will tell you, when I first came down here, this is a, a, a man named Mr. Gibbs, um, I was asked to, uh, to represent the community in a civil rights complaint. And uh, they organized this town hall meeting that I was presenting in about Title VI and um, the civil rights strategy. And Mr. Gibbs stood up and he said, why should we trust you? We've gone to meeting after meeting. Nobody tests our water. Nobody tests our air. Nobody does anything for us. They come in here. They make a big splash. EPA, the Region 4 folks, the headquarters folks came here, and they left, and we never heard from them again. Why should we trust you? Nobody is t paying any attention to us. And, and that is part of the problem. That is part of the problem in Flint as well. You see that over and over across the country. So we need strategies that lift up that engagement, that recognize that engagement, that give meaning to what people's experience is. It's not, you know, yes, we want outcomes that are direct outcomes. We want governments or judges or whoever to say, yes, you're right, and change things. But part of what happens is people feel lost. People give up hope. And so some of the strategies that, have to, that address these health disparities are strategies that engage people and that provide voice, provide opportunities for voice. What was your answer to this question? <laughs> you shouldn't trust me. You shouldn't trust anybody, right? I mean, I have to prove myself like anybody else. But I'm listening. I'm here. And I've been to Mr. Gibbs' house, and I've been to the community center that he runs, Bright Eyes Nightclub, and we've talked, and we've gotten to know one another, and we're back, and, you know, the proof is in the pudding. There is no answer. I will tell you, too, that the landfill is not the only environmental hazard in this community. They have a sewage spray field that's been leaking into the river for a decade, and the state knows about it, and it's polluting the Alabama River. And they have a cheese plant that sprays the waste out into the community. So he said, what can you do for us on those issues, too? And I've been out there trying to find them counsel to do something about these issues. So it's engagement is the answer. I just want to recognize that litigation and legal advocacy is only one piece of a larger struggle. It's a critical piece. And we have to recognize the unequal treatment and, and, and give it the backbone to recognize that law is a part of this. We should expect our justice system to address these problems. 
But I also want to recognize it's part of a whole set of tactics. And we don't have to rely on lawyers to engage in those lawyers. They're only one part of it. Um, and I also want to recognize that Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and other civil rights laws are only one set of tools in the toolbox. We have other tools I don't have time to talk about, but there are environmental laws. Some of them are critical for engaging and, rec and, and providing a forum, uh, an opportunity for uh, discussing health equity issues. I would say the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, is particularly important. It's a pr another procedural statute. And, um, and uh, you know, time permitting, we could talk more about some of those other legal tools. But I do want to talk about Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. You're all familiar with it, more than 50 years old. No person in the United States shall, on the ground of race, color, or national origin, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving financial assistance. So any program or activity, public or private, state governments, local governments, hospitals, any government, uh, any program or activity receiving financial assistance cannot discriminate on the basis of race or ethnicity. And you'll see in the next section that the statute gives agencies the authority to pass regulations that will further define what this means. And it's very broad. You can't exclude, you can't deny benefits, or you can't discriminate. Title VI was used to desegregate southern schools and hospitals. I, I mentioned that it was very broad. Every federal agency has regulations implementing Title VI. And under those regulations, intentional discrimination is prohibited and unjustified actions with a disproportionate impact is, uh, is prohibited. It's also particularly important for to, to, for, as a lever for ensuring the provision of linguistically appropriate services. So I've used uh, Title VI, for example, um, together with the Attorney General in New York State and other places to challenge hospitals that weren't providing services in, in Spanish or other languages, pharmacies that weren't providing services in people's languages. They're required to, it's under Title VI, and so it's an important lever. It's also an important level for engagement. If agencies like in New Mexico are not uh, doing outreach, in their environmental review process in Spanish or in other languages, they're violating Title VI. And, and I, I want to say that this is, some of what goes on under Title VI is litigation, but a lot of it is administrative advocacy, and a lot of it also is forward thinking, so that um, what we can ask of recipients of federal funds, what we can ask of the states and localities if they're making decisions, that they should ensure that they are complying with Title VI. So what they should be doing is a health equity analysis up front. And I'm going to say a couple, a couple words about what that means. But they should ensure that they're complying with Title VI. So we can ask them to do that, and we can do that in partnership between communities and, uh, and scientists. Um, this is just a sample agency regulation. It's the EPA regulation. But you'll notice it, every agency has about, about the same language. They prohibit not only actions that are intentionally discriminatory, but also actions that have a disproportionate impact on the basis of race, color, or national origin. What is, <clears throat> I mentioned an equity analysis. So what does that mean? It means that before taking an action or when, they, when, a, when a recipient of federal funds, when I'll just say a, a state or, or other recipient of federal funds is making a decision or has a policy, it should ask itself. And, and, they, and, and every time they receive federal funds, they have to sign something from the federal government, an assurance that says, we are complying with Title VI. So how can they do that if they haven't run through this analysis? They should do the equity analysis that describes the program or activity or the decision. They analyze the burdens and benefits and whether they're disproportionately falling on the basis of race or ethnicity or language. They analyze, is there a less discriminatory way of doing this if it does disproportionately fall on the basis of race? Include the stakeholders in that process and then implement a less discriminatory alternative to achieve their aims if they have one. This is a critical uh, method for trying to get in front of the game rather than, uh, rather than wait until you've got a problem. And every day in this country, every single day, there are permits going out for approval. Every day, state governments, local governments are making decisions that are exacerbating these racial inequalities. Instead, what they should be doing is they should be evaluating the problem and they should be taking less discriminatory alternatives. Once they make the decision, 
uh, the federal funder, say EPA or Department of Interior or Department of Energy, whoever it might be, can then come in and say, are they complying with Title VI? Or we as communities may ask that question. And in order to evaluate a disproportionate impact claim, you say, is there an impact? Is it disproportionate on the basis of race? It's all pretty straightforward. Is it justified? What is the justification for doing things in this way? Is there a less discriminatory alternative, an alternative that has a less disproportionate impact? And is there anything else they can do? Um, this analysis of adversity, of whether there's a disproportionate impact, is an area where science can really play a role and important partnerships can happen. Uh, Community-based participatory research is critical here. Um, it's communities that know what they're going through, as Dr. Bullard said. They, know, they hold up that water and someone could be testing it. Um, it is also an opportunity for epidemiological research, for longitudinal research. We need monitoring. Water keepers are out often across the country doing water monitoring. Um, we need anecdotal research, but we also bring to bear, if I'm going to say this landfill is having an effect, I look at the whole landscape of literature to say, is there literature out there about the proximity, living in proximity to a landfill and what the, what the effects are? And I can bring to bear that, that research. So it is critical to have a scientific agenda that will then relate these health hazards, exposure to health hazards, with these kind of outcomes. Um, I just want to mention that there are a lot of other examples I could give you. Um, in Uniontown, we're using uh, the Title VI um, strategy, and we've got this claim in, and EPA is investigating. This is uh, a landfill called Stones Throw Landfill, which was plopped down in the middle of historic African American uh, land owner ownership. This, this land ownership is receding. It's part of the problem of black land loss. Be and as it recedes, the landfill is eating up more and more, of, or it, the reason it's receding is the landfill is eating up more and more and more of people's land. Um, this is a picture of landfill. They also brought a Title VI complaint. This is um, another example in Eastern North Carolina. I have the honor of representing the North Carolina Environmental Justice Network. This shows the correlation between, it's kind of a, on a state level, what Dr. Bullard was talking about at the national level. The correlation between where people of color live, African Americans, Latinos, and Native Americans, and where hog facilities are located. The little dots are hog facilities. It would be even more condensed if, you, um, if we showed the number of hogs per facility. They're grossly condensed in that area. Um, and, uh, and Duplin County, which is right smack in the middle of that very red area where all those dots are, there are 43 pigs per person in Duplin County. And I'm not even talking about also the chicken waste and the, and the turkey waste that's there. Um, so the areas where hog facilities are located are very closely related to the percent non-white in the population. And uh, it has huge problems associated with it, which we could talk more about. But I just am trying to give it as an example of um, you know, how frequently, how many problems are associated with environmental uh, degradation and health, negative health outcomes, and how frequently they are related to race. This, by the way, is a spray field where the waste is sprayed out onto the spray field. When the wind comes, it captures the manure and literally blows onto people's front lawn. And that is a ditch. That's, this is taken from, during a flyover. That's a ditch where the waste is going out. You can see on the bottom corner the stream, Stocking Head Creek, and the waste is literally flowing from that spray field out into the stream. Needless to say, they do not have clean water. That is the waste being sprayed. So um, why do we use civil rights strategies, which we're using in each of these situations and others? First, I talked about how it increases the visibility of the issue of race. In Eastern North Carolina, people have been struggling for decades, literally decades, to bring this environmental justice issue to people's attention. And uh, they are being ignored. And the issue, and we can bring Clean Water Act cases. We, can, we can't really bring Clean Air Act cases for technical reasons. You can, you can do a lot of things. But they lose the, the truth that people are experiencing that they are not being listened to because of race. It's a fundamental civil rights issue. And together with the other strategies, together with bringing that Clean Water Act case, together with organizing, together with appealing to um, your state government, 
the civil rights claim lifts up that issue and gives it some, some language. It engages stakeholders. People are angry about these issues. They want to do something. Otherwise, the frustration eats away at themselves. It gives them a place to do that. It frames the experience. We can talk about adversity. We can talk about the impact and how the impact is disproportionate on the basis of race. It forges partnership. Um, we work very closely with uh, an absolutely wonderful epidemiologist named Steve Wing. And, and I see some heads going like this, um, and other social scientists and scientists who have been looking at the, the relationship between living in proximity and going to school in proximity to CAFOs for co confined animal feeding operations, for example, industrial animal facilities, and outcomes like uh, asthma and, and, and blood pressure, high blood pressure, et cetera. Um, and so people are working together on these issues. It creates opportunity for, uh, for communication and leverage. So when you file the civil rights suit, people will sit down and talk to you in a way that if you didn't file a civil rights suit, you, you, uh, they may not. And I'm going to speak in a sec in my last couple of slides um, about situations where it actually itself produces results. So I don't want to say all of this is procedural. There are many situations, and, and uh, Robert Garcia, one of the commissioners, can talk about his experiences where it's actually produced results, but there are many. Um, often outside of the context of the Environmental Protection Agency, but that's where we have the opportunity to make this happen in the context of the Environmental uh, Protection Agency. So it changes policies and can also change outcomes, especially going hand in hand with, um, with other tactics. Um, the law is central here. We have a law, we, ha we have a set of, I mean, we are, we're sitting here kind of in the, not the wake, but in the, in the movement of the Black Lives Matter movement. It's so important to recognize the role of race and not to hide it. And it's also important to recognize when, um, when government decision making and private decision making have run afoul of the law. That is a piece of the story, the denial of equal protection, that we can't ignore. And civil, the civil rights frame and using these levers lifts up that issue. And I have to say that I think as a result of the Black Lives Matter movement, we're at a moment where people understand it. It didn't matter whether the, consciously in someone's head when they're shooting someone, they're thinking, oh, I really want to you know, injure a person of color. That's not what's going on. We get that. And we should get the fact that when people are making decisions about permits and location, it doesn't matter what consciously is in their head. What matters is who's being affected and that we don't dump on certain communities. And people get away with things because they're dumping on disenfranchised communities. So Title VI is exactly intended to address those issues. I've studied um, what, are, what are often cited as the worst Title VI cases when we used to be able to go to court. I should say that as a result of a 2001 decision, Sandoval, Alexander versus Sandoval in the Supreme Court, unless we can show intentional discrimination, we can't go to court in these claims. If you can show intentional discrimination, and sometimes you can. They're hard cases, but sometimes you can, particularly in the South, you can go to court. But if you're making a claim that there's an action with a disproportionate impact on the basis of race, you have to file an administrative complaint. And um, so I, I looked at some of these old cases where people used to go to court to make a disparate impact claim. And they're often known as the worst cases because uh, courts ruled against them. In every one of those cases, Bryan versus Koch, Wilmington, Delaware, Bayer County, Texas, communities got a lot of what they asked for. The court may not have finally ruled in their favor, but these Title VI claims provided leverage for communities in their negotiations, and they were critical to saving healthcare services in low-income communities of color. This is an important lev lever for change. I mentioned, uh, Title VI being used as a, as a lever for ensuring linguistically appropriate programs or activities. Tremendous success stories in that, in that category, which we could talk about. And I want to say, uh, just last December, in Corpus Christi, Texas, um, the communities filed a complaint. Actually, they filed in March. And they were challenging a plan to move a highway or to build a highway straight through a historic community, a, a historic community of color. They filed this complaint with the Department of Transportation, the Federal Highway Administration. By December, by mid-December, Federal Highway Administration had, had sat down and come up with a resolution agreement with the Texas Department of Transportation. After threatening to hold up 
more than half a billion dollars in funding for that project. And, and folks have been uh, offered opportunities to move out, and the plans have changed, and that was directly a lever for change, and there are a lot of stories like that, particularly in the transportation context. So um, in, in closing, I just want to say that there is a law, that there are a set of laws that are applicable, that they're critical means for framing the issue, and they're also a critical means for engaging communities lifting up their experience and actually making change. Thank you.